Good morning. Welcome to Newsmakers. On February the 23rd, Lorenzo Collins, a mentally ill Avondale man, escaped from police custody while being examined at University Hospital. After fleeing several blocks, police caught up with Collins when he refused to drop a brick which he held in a threatening manner. Cincinnati Police Officer Douglas D. Podesta and UC Officer John Engel fired four shots, three of which struck Collins, who died four days later. Since then, protesters have taken to the streets demanding a response from authorities. Hamilton County Prosecutor Joe Dieters ruled that the officers committed no criminal violations. And 10 days ago, Cincinnati City Manager John Shirey made public the results of a study by the Police Department's Internal Investigations Unit. I am joined this morning by Cincinnati City Manager John Shirey to discuss the findings of this study and where we go from here. Welcome to Newsmakers. As Morning, Dan. you know, we have done several Newsmakers shows over the last few months uh, focusing on the Collins incident, and I've been on the phone to you and or, asking you to come on, and I think you said that you couldn't right, right at that point. You needed this report to be finished, and, um, and then you contacted us, and I appreciate your being here this morning. Um, I have to say, I'm a little surprised by this report. I guess when I got it, I expected to see a lot of information about what Officer DePodesto did and what Officer Engel did and all of that, but this doesn't really focus on that part of the incident. It focuses on other officers. Is it that this report just accepts what the prosecutor did and moved on from there? Well, uh, first of all, what, what you have seen and what was released to the public was a summary report and there's a much more extensive report. In fact, there's boxes full of material that we didn't think people would want to sort through in order to just get the essence of the decision that was made. So that's why you didn't see more information that's in that report. That, that report is, is not uh, just simply taken from the action by the Hamilton County prosecutor. Uh, we did, uh, in effect, two separate investigations. One was a criminal investigation, uh, which is pretty unusual for the police department to do. Normally, these things are reviewed as internal investigations, but on this one, given the seriousness of the incident, we first had it reviewed for criminal wrongdoing by the officers. That led to an investigation that was summarized, turned over to the county prosecutor. We also did, from that, another review with a view towards whether or not these officers uh, have conducted themselves according to departmental rules and regulations as well as according to law. So there's really two reviews, two investigations. One doesn't flow necessarily from what the Hamilton County prosecutor decided to do. Okay, so the criminal investigation focused probably more on the real shooting the actual shots fired incident, is that, would that be fair? That, that's correct, and uh, it's probably also safe to say that, that what we refer to as the administrative review was more broad ranging, uh, looked at the actions of all of the officers uh, from the second this whole incident started that day. In fact, as you read that report, as I read that report, there's a couple of things that, that emerge there. There's a reference to a officer, Jeffrey Battison, who uh, it, the question is, who yelled, shoot him, shoot him, about a minute 20 seconds before the actual shots were fired? And in the process, this report identifies Jeffrey Battison as the officer who made that, called out those words, although he denies that he did it. Um, yet that's the finding of this report. What will, what's the punishment for that? What's, that the report ruled that that was an unwise thing for him to do. Is that correct? Well, uh, I think it probably used a, a word stronger than un unwise, unwise right. but uh, uh, that, that was uh, certainly inappropriate. And, and uh, while uh, that officer may have felt that another officer was in some sort of danger, uh, we talked to the officer involved from University of Cincinnati, and he didn't feel that way. Uh, so, in, in that light, we feel that uh, Officer Battison's comments uh, were just very inappropriate. And uh, there isn't any uh, punishment uh, spelled out in the report because under our procedure, 
uh, an officer who is slated for discipline goes through what's called a pre-disciplinary review hearing. Uh, in that hearing, the officer gets a chance to present his or her case, uh, and then afterwards, uh, command staff make a decision about what level of punishment, if any, uh, should be meted out. So the report uh, doesn't say in my statement, uh, in my statement I didn't say uh, what that discipline is going to be. We have to go through that hearing first, and then there will be an announcement about appropriate discipline for that officer. Another situation that's uh, highlighted in this report that I don't think we in the press have paid much, if any, attention to is an officer by the name of Vaughn, John Vaughn, who was apparently at the scene, observed the shooting, was in a position to observe the shooting, and then left the scene. And the way the report puts it, it, it says he went to the Clifton Perkins and sat in the restroom for 20 minutes. Almost sounds like he hid out in the restroom for 20 minutes, then returned to the scene. I take it from the tone of the report that that was something that you're very concerned about, th those actions of, of Officer Vaughn. Is that correct? The fact is uh, I didn't even know about Officer Vaughn uh, until really uh, uh, some several weeks, a few months uh, after we had started the investigation of this incident. Most people that have been following this very closely are aware that there were 15 officers uh, kind of in a semicircle in that side yard uh, around Mr. Collins. Uh, Officer Vaughn was not one of those. Uh, he was off to the side uh, behind the fence uh, and as it turned out uh, was in a position to observe the entire incident. Uh, as you just described, uh, what turns out to be the case is that after the shooting he left the scene. Uh, didn't report to anybody that he was there, uh, didn't report to a, a, a sergeant uh, who arrived on the scene that uh, he had seen the incident uh, and as you described uh, left the scene, uh, went to a, a restaurant, uh, uh, came back later, actually assisted in directing traffic and assisting in some of the follow-up and wasn't until uh, the next day apparently or sometime later that he revealed the fact that he had been there and seen the incident. Uh, that disturbs uh, all of us. Uh, uh, he had a duty uh, to report immediately to a superior uh, that he had witnessed the thing and, and that he should have reported everything that he had seen right then. Uh, there's another aspect of this which bothers me. Uh, I've been very concerned about the fact that that day uh, we had officers uh, with very little seniority. Uh, I'm speaking now only of Cincinnati police officers, not officers from the University of Cincinnati. Uh, that particular officer, Mr. Vaughn, um, had, had more seniority than anybody else on the scene. And it, it seems to me that perhaps he should have been providing some leadership at, at that time. Now, maybe he arrived too late to do that. I'm not sure exactly, but at a minimum, he should have reported exactly what he saw, and he'll get another opportunity uh, to explain uh, what was going on in his mind that day as a result of the disciplinary hearing that I just described. He has the same procedure, and uh, he'll have a chance to say once again uh, what he saw and uh, why he did what he did that day in terms of leaving the scene. So both of those officers are in the same situation now that there's another disciplinary hearing and the city will then rule on what happens as a result of that. That's right. And the discipline could be different. For each one of them. For each oh, one. Oh, absolutely. Because the, the, the discipline are... fits the incident. I understand. Mm -hmm. uh, you just raised, though, a couple of, of questions uh, in your last comments that I want to get to, and I'll get to them at this point. One. What is the relationship of the Cincinnati Police Force to the University of Cincinnati Police Force? I have to tell you that my view of the University of Cincinnati Police Force as an adjunct professor, as a person who goes to that campus was, University Police write tickets for people who can't find parking spaces and park in illegal spaces. i got to pile them. Um, but all of a sudden it sounds like here they are performing normal police functions on the streets of Cincinnati. I was surprised by all of that. 
do they fall under your supervision and your review? Do you have any supervision of that? Um, what is the case with the UC police? The, the UC police operate as a, as a separate entity. Uh, they do not fall under my jurisdiction uh, or, or any jurisdiction of the uh, city of Cincinnati. Uh, they're under the supervision of, of the university and the university hospital. And so uh, that's their employer and, and uh, I'm the employer for Cincinnati police officers. Uh, uh, obviously, uh, we try to work together uh, because they're providing policing for a, a part of the greater Cincinnati jurisdiction. Uh, one of the things that uh, was disturbing about this incident is that there was not a good radio communication between the two operations, uh, again pointing out the fact that they're, they're really independent. Uh, much has been made of the fact that our officers did not know that Mr. Collins was on what's referred to generally as a, as a mental hold, this is jargon, uh, for police officers uh, on the eighth floor of, of uh, University Hospital. They knew there was a police hold. They did not know that there was a mental hold. All the UC officers knew that because through their radio communications they had found that out. But our officers can't hear their communication responses. And so uh, that just points out that we need to look at that and there needs to be a closer relationship than there has been. And could that at least possibly factor into why when Lorenzo Collins was holding the brick, the UC officer initially claimed he didn't feel threatened by that, whereas Officer Battison felt that that officer was threatened. Perhaps knowing different things about Lorenzo Collins could have affected their perception of the situation? Well, in an incident like this, there's always a lot of of Monday morning quarterbacking about what could have been. And I, I can't sit here and tell you that had our officers known that, uh, there would have been some totally different outcome. Uh, we just know that that's an important piece of information that wasn't known, and we've got to make sure that's corrected and avoid those kinds of problems in the future. The other thing that you raised in this earlier comment was the youthfulness slash inexperience of street officers. And a lot of people have commented about that in this situation. You mentioned that Officer Vaughn was the, the person with the officer with the most experience and he left the scene. But these were very young people, mid 20s mo for the most part, who were involved in this incident from the Cincinnati Police Force. Is that a problem? And from what you said, it didn't, you think it probably is. And what do we do about that? Well, I think it is a problem. Uh, uh, this was a Sunday afternoon. And uh, it's probably not surprising to anybody to hear that, that in our, our labor agreement, uh, assignments uh, get done on the basis of seniority. And uh, so what happens on a Sunday afternoon is that people with less seniority end up with those assignments. Uh, in addition, uh, there was no sergeant on the scene that day. Uh, two sergeants were en route, uh, but didn't arrive in time uh, for the actual incident. Uh, it does concern me that uh, we didn't have very senior officers on the scene that day. Uh, Officer De Podesta uh, was the senior person in that group of, of officers around Mr. Collins. Uh, at the time, he had two years and 10 months on the force. Uh, still a very junior officer in my mind, uh, given the complexity of a police officer's job. What are we doing about it? Well, uh, one of the things that, that has come out of this uh, uh, is that uh, we need to increase the number of sergeants that we have on the force. I, I think people know uh, that for the last few years, we've been adding officers to this police force. It's a much bigger police force than when I came to this city. Uh, three years ago. Uh, we've added officers, but we weren't adding appropriate numbers of sergeants as we kept adding officers. We've been running two academies a year. We've been graduating a lot of people, but we need to have more supervision. So as a result of this, we're going to add 15 sergeants to the police force so that we can reduce those spans of control. 
well, I have to take a break, but stay right there. And you stay with us as well. Obviously, we haven't gotten to some of the really important questions in this incident. We'll be right back. Welcome back. Uh, John, let's get to what has, has been in the news, and that is the situation with Officer DePodesta. Uh, where does his status stand, and could you explain why you've taken the approach you have to his particular situation? Well, right now, uh, Officer DePodesta has been stripped of his police powers. Uh, he's not allowed to carry a badge or a gun, and he's been assigned to basically desk duty within the department. So he's still employed, but uh, is, is not uh, able to be on the street as a, as a regular police officer. Uh, this, of course, is a very uh, emotional issue. Uh, many people are upset with uh, my decision that Officer DePodesta was not fired. Uh, and, uh, you know, I've tried to explain what led to my uh, decision, and let me try that again. Uh, a lot of people uh, look at me and say, well, you're the city manager, you can do anything you want. And that's not true. Uh, I have to work within a system of laws and regulations, too. Uh, all of the employees in the city of Cincinnati are in a civil service system. They cannot be removed without cause. Uh, I have to have findings, conclusions, in order to remove a police officer, uh, or else uh, my decision is appealed, and just about every one of our personnel decisions is appealed. Uh, it's appealed, uh, it goes to eventually to uh, an arbitrator. Uh, if, if there's not a basis for that, uh, typically we're overturned and the officer is restored uh, to, uh, to rank with back pay. Uh, and, and that's not an outcome that I want to see occur here either. In terms of having to make a decision about Officer D. Podesta, uh, I had to take into account a number of different factors. Uh, some of it is based on law, including Supreme Court decisions that give us a lot of guidance. Uh, on police officer uh, issues with respect to serious incidents like this, but also some other circumstances. First of all, as I related, we did a criminal investigation, sent it to the Hamilton County prosecutor. That was returned with no charges. So case number one. Secondly, simultaneous with our review, there's a review being done of the UC officer who also fired that day, uh, who had been off, but I knew that their conclusion was that he had not broken any rules or regulations and that he was going to be returned to duty back on the street, full police powers. Thirdly, in considering the, the law in this area, uh, there, there are several cases that have to be taken together, but one of the key Supreme Court cases says that in considering uh, use of force, like in this case, uh, we have to review it from the standpoint of a reasonable officer on the scene and not, and not from the standpoint of 2020 hindsight. Those are the actual words in that Supreme Court decision. In addition, there has to be probable cause of a threat of danger to the officer. In this case, there are several officers right at the scene who have issued statements and who will testify that at a critical juncture, Mr. Collins advanced towards the two officers. Some say charge, some say advance, ran, walked, They're, they use different words, but they generally are saying he advanced on them with a brick held in some general position at the shoulder or above, even over the head, uh, and, and uh, made advances towards these officers. Uh, they fired their weapons. This is after Officer D. Podesta had twice 
called for a taser weapon, after he had once called for a canine, a dog to be brought to the scene. This is after several officers had used chemical irritant, usually reported as mace, but we don't actually use mace, uh, and uh, several commands from the officers to Mr. Collins to drop the brick. So there was a progression here where several steps were taken uh, to remove the threat. Uh, there was an escalation. Uh, the man uh, held the brick, continued to hold the brick over his head, and moved towards the officers. In addition, what's interesting here is that two officers fired, one from the University of Cincinnati, one from the Cincinnati Police Division. Any sense of who fired first? Uh, there, there, there is, but my point is that both officers thought they fired first. Okay. Because their firing, their, 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 their first two shots were so close together that neither one of them knew which one had actually fired first. The point being, these two officers are from two different units. They come from different backgrounds, they have different experience levels, and they have different training. But both officers say they felt threatened and that they had resolved other means to try to stop Mr. Collins. Given that, and given that he is in this status right now where he's not on the street, doesn't have a gun, doesn't have a badge, what are your options? And I have heard from a number of people that, in fact, he'll never end up back on the street. But what are, I mean, is there, is there still something that is, we're waiting for? Is there a final disposition of this, just as there's a final disposition of the other two officers' case in this? Or is he just in this limbo? In reviewing Mr. De Podesta's personal file, what struck me was that this is not his first serious incident. Uh, he was involved in another incident where uh, the subject died. Uh, he was involved in another incident uh, that was an altercation in the community where it's right. sort of referred to now as a riot. Uh, and again, this is an officer with only two years, ten months on the job, and he's had these three very serious incidents already. He's, he's seen more action than a lot of officers seen in a 25-year career. I have serious reservations about his suitability uh, to continue as a police officer. And one of the things that we did in addition to stripping him of his police powers is that I've ordered up a, a, a review of his fitness for duty. Uh, and, and that will be done by uh, a professional psychiatrist, somebody who's very experienced in this field of reviewing uh, police officers and their, their mental psyche for uh, being on the street in, in a pressure-packed job uh, every day of the week. We're going to be running out of time here. Does that mean when that report comes back, you've got another decision to make? That's true. It that wouldn't be based strictly on this incident, but be based on all of these incidents plus the psychiatric review? That is true. When, when that occurs, uh, I'll have another decision to make. Uh, and, and, of course, I'm not going to prejudge that in terms of what the outcome is, but I can say right now, uh, uh, I think there are a lot of reasons as to why uh, Mr. De Podesta should not be on the street, and that's why he's not on the street. That's why he's uh, relegated to a desk job. And what do you expect is the timing on that next uh, study to come back? I, I really don't know how long that will take. Uh, uh, it will not be done quickly. Uh, in the meantime, we'll do uh, our own uh, civilian review using my OMI investigators uh, to come up with another review and report. We're down to about 30 seconds, but on the broader issues of policy, uh, bean bags have been implemented, uh, more sergeants on the street. Can we expect uh, more of these sorts of decisions about both equipment and tactics? And we're very short on time. For myself, Kent Ryan, our safety director, and Michael Snowden, the police chief, we wish there had been another outcome of this incident. Uh, we've got to do everything we can to prevent these kinds of tragic uh, occurrences in our city. And so, yes, we're going to be looking for other less lethal ways 
that we can control serious situations. Well, thank you very much for being with us. I really appreciate you coming, and any time that you feel like you want to explain, you're welcome back here at Newsmakers. Thank you very much. Okay. Thank you for joining us this morning. Uh, next week, we will have Congressman Rob Portman to talk about the commission that he chaired on reforming the IRS. Good morning.